Welcome everybody to uh, an Astound Commerce live Q&A on the topic of Salesforce order management. My name is Blair Campbell. I'm editor-in-chief at Astound and I'm here with a very expert panel on this topic today. We've got a Salesforce OMS solution architect Mike Bowen with us today. We've got Steve Collins, Astound Vice President for Salesforce Multi-Cloud Solutions and we've got Nathan Anderson who is also a principal solution architect at Astound. So Salesforce order management uh, was introduced at the end of 2019. It's an order management system built directly on the Salesforce platform. And shortly after its launch, Mike Bowen uh, authored for us a series of articles. It was very popular on our website. And so today we're going to use that series of articles as a springboard for a, we hope, lively conversation on this topic. So Mike, you wrote this series of introductory articles and you highlighted a few key benefits back when we launched this. So you've had, you know, roughly a year, a little bit more working with this solution. Um, I'd love to hear what you now see as its main benefits and its best features. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, it, it feels like a really short amount of time since I wrote that article because um, time has just flown by, but we do have a few projects under our belt now. And um, really at this point, uh, the uh, experience with it has been incredible, um, you know, to see all the marketing stuff for a while and then go in and actually work with the platform, obviously, uh, is, are two different uh, beasts. But um, to answer your question, I mean, the really the um, the platform integrations with Service Cloud and the fact that it sits on Salesforce uh, itself, you know, it's, it shares a database. It's the same um, application code that runs uh, all the customizations in OMS and Service Cloud. They're so close together and coupled that it it makes it um, both a treat to develop on as well as, you know, makes it for a lot of use cases um, within service and um, all the reporting tools and everything that just make it seamless. Um, you know, we've had a few opportunities to really push the system to its uh, limits in terms of both uh, handling order throughput as well as um, customizing the user experience to work uh, in ways that the product managers of the product may have never intended. Um, and we've had good success customizing flows um, creating custom lightning web components that um, allow for like direct input of orders uh, and building orders right in service cloud service cloud so um, really it's that tie-in and um, as a salesforce longtime salesforce architect it's just nice to have something in the digital commerce space uh, that is on platform that is uh, you know um, kind of a seamless transfer. There's a huge developer network. We've got great APIs uh, and it's easy to take, um, you know, people that are experts within service cloud in those areas and transition them to order management because it's kind of like a sister brother relationship. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a great experience so far and we're looking forward to uh, continuing to um, learn more about it and share that with you guys on the presentation. Great. Okay. So just leaping off of your, your point about the, the sort of Salesforce ecosystem, um, talk, to, talk to us about, you know, any of you can, can take this one, but talk to you about where this, talk to us about where this offering fits within the Salesforce ecosystem in terms of offering companies a 360 degree view of their customers. Yeah, I can answer that one. I think, um, I think it's actually a really exciting one in, in terms of that because this is something that Salesforce talks about a ton. They have for years, but there hasn't been uh, there hasn't been really that much to, to really connect the dots. It, there's a lot of capability, a lot of potential for it, but OMS is one of the first productized things that you can buy the licenses for. And if you're a Commerce Cloud customer, B2C Commerce Cloud customer, and you're a Service Cloud customer. This will plug right in the right in the middle, and for the first time, really show you those customers, your your B two C customers and Commerce Cloud. See all of that right there in Service Cloud natively, um, and uh, I, I think it does a really good job of bridging that. It's it's not a you know it's not everything it's going to be yet, 
uh, but it, but I think there's a ton of potential uh, to to be one of those core products that if you are doing commerce and you have Salesforce, you will want to be a part of the OMS product. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just add that. I think. Uh, oh, go ahead, Steve. Let you talk. No, I think. Yeah, I was just saying. I, I think it also works uh, in reverse as well, right? So I think Nathan was highlighting being able to give uh, insight into your own a company's internal employees and their service employees. Uh, but I think as well, uh, because it is connected, because order management is so tightly connected now to commerce uh, for the first time, it is a saving on integrations that we typically had to do for every commerce implementation. And those those integrations could be you know, very simple or they could be very messy uh, to make sure that we're always surfacing uh, the latest and greatest order status, um, refund information, return information. Uh, now all of that stuff is getting serviced back to the customer. So it not, it's, it's not just giving uh, you as a business owner a 360-degree view into your customer and their ordering, but it's also giving a much more robust view in to your customers themselves into all of their order data and how they're interacting with you as a business. Okay, Mike, did you have something you wanted to add before we move on? Yeah, I was, I was going to mention that uh, there are some challenges around customer 360 and really making that work uh, in more of an advanced way with OMS and, and C360. Um, you know, knowing that C360 is a separate product that you can enable, um, that would open up a lot more uh, ways to kind of unify your customer um, single source of truth type um, situation. But um, OMS is, they've enhanced this uh, capability to sync customers between uh, SFCC and, and OMS, but it started with just, it matches on email address. Um, they're um, now releasing functionality to have matching rules and basic stuff, but it's not, um, you know, if you have a really, uh, you know, complex strategy for matching and deduplicating customers and those kind of things, we uh, have dealt with building and customizing that to work best uh, or, or to modify the way that is working. Um, and that's all possible, but the way that it comes out of the box is is kind of assuming that you have a really basic matching strategy and everything. Okay. And so you you touched on some some challenges. What were some unexpected challenges? I know you guys have now implemented this solution for several clients. Are there other things you could speak to that sort of weren't weren't foreseen? And and how did you navigate those challenges? Yeah, and uh, I'm sure Nathan and Steve will have some additional things to add, but uh, I'll start with, you know, integration from uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, which we'll touch on a little bit uh, later, I'm sure, because there's always questions about this part of the uh, the product. Um, but basically, the, the integration from SFCC to OMS is this Heroku connector that Salesforce product has. And it's really great because we can just plug that in flip a switch and we have an integration, a productized integration that carries in all the order data, all the payment instrument data, all of that stuff, um, even product information at the time of order uh, export from OMS. The thing is it does also lock you into some constraints because it's productized. We can't change the source code in that integration. So we expected this coming into our uh, implementations and we indeed found that um, you know, the mappings for some of the objects in SFCC, um, you know, maybe at the payment level uh, or something like that, custom field that you put on that object isn't just going to magically map for every bit of the object model. The core things are covered, you know, and that's the strategy we've used to mitigate that problem is to copy data maybe from the payment to the, the order level um, or something like that to just kind of re- um, work the way the integration will send that data over. So there's ways around it, but it's definitely caused some headaches when writing technical documentation and helping uh, you know developers understand um, how they're going to implement that integration. Um, another uh, top of the mind challenge we've seen is uh, the invoicing and credit memo uh, pieces, the fin kind of the financial document uh, object model and pieces of the platform. They predated Salesforce order management and the Salesforce product team based their uh, implementations of these object models and the way that those are created in the platform, those are based on existing uh, functionality. 
And so there's some disparity between the objects. You'll see mismatching fields. You could tell there were some things added uh, to support the um, kind of financial pieces of the OMS that were kind of shoehorned in maybe. Um, so we've had to create some triggers to copy data from uh, one object to another. Uh, and it makes training the customer pretty tricky sometimes too, because uh, the object model is kind of complicated. Uh, it's, and it's kind of hard to see that, um, that data at a glance sometimes. So those are two I can think of. Um, you guys have any others that you wanted to add? Yeah, I think uh, expanding exactly on that last point you made that I think one of the trickiest things in terms of, of implementing a project and then handing that off to the customer is because of the the nature of all the objects involved in an OMS in the OMS package, there's just a lot. And so when you look at an order, there there can be upwards of 20 different objects involved to store the data about an order, which which is all built that way for a purpose. Uh, to make those things function nice and cleanly and independently and store all that data uh, separately. But uh, if you try to just look at the order, sometimes you find yourself having to click through and click through and click through five, six levels deep to find that piece of information that you're looking for. So, um, you know, getting around that, there's a lot of things you can do, like Mike mentioned earlier with on the SFCC side, bringing data up to the order header level. You can do some similar things like that uh, on the OMS side to bring that data up and make those key things show up a level or two higher. So that customer service, when they're just trying to look quickly at an order's details, they can see those things uh, a little bit faster. So uh, I'd say the other side of that is reporting um, right now in the pro in the product, there's not really a starter package of reports. Uh, and so every customer needs to kind of start from scratch. And that's something that uh, it's important to know as a as an implementer that that's going to take more time than 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 usual to just go through and work through defining those reports, making sure everything matches up. And something that not all Salesforce implementations have to deal with is those things needing to like financial information needing to be of a certain level of fidelity that that maybe uh, um, other data doesn't need to be. So um, that that's something that can be a little bit tricky. So we've we've spent some time starting to pull together kind of our own OMS starter package that that cleans up some of those things, uh, adds adds some of that visibility in places, and also creates that starter package of reports that at least customers have something to start from. Everyone's going to need to build more specific things on top of that, but kind of speeding that process up and giving them a starter uh, starter set of reports to look at and react to and maybe make a small customization to instead of defining and building it from scratch. Yeah, and I think in addition to the starter packer reports and to be able to enable the starter packer reports um, is having just some sample data uh, that touches all of the different mm -hmm. objects. Uh, so having some orders, some order summaries, some fulfillment orders and returns and RBAs in just different statuses to be able to build and run those samples reports off of. Having that also enables anybody else that needs to pull data out of the system um, really from day one to be able to uh, model their system data. So we've worked with some analytics companies um, that are building operational reports um, in, a, out in an external data warehouse. Um, and so if you're waiting until you get, uh, you know, halfway done through your implementation, so you have actual data from whatever your WMS is or your ERP is, you know, that can really um, limit uh, or, or can lead to some changes um, that come in late, what is relatively late in the game to be able to accommodate that kind of operational reporting. And so by making some of that stuff available up front in that starter pack, um, that also helps to A, facilitate um, discussions during the requirements gathering side of things, uh, but then also gives everybody uh, kind of a common uh, starting, pay, starting point for that information. Uh, yeah, and then I, mean, I think the other, another one is um, just around uh, the app exchange packages. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was something, especially as we were initially starting out um, with the order management product, uh, there weren't really any app exchange packages that had gone through a security review um, and had really gone through what is the full Salesforce certification process uh, to be listed on the app exchange. Um, 
it, it's you know it's kind of interesting, right? A lot of the people that are using Salesforce order management um, really got their first uh, introduction to uh, Salesforce as a company and building things for Salesforce with the Salesforce Commerce Cloud side of things, um, and the rules around how. Uh, how building connectors or building packages for Salesforce Commerce Cloud and Salesforce Core, um, they're, they're very different. Um, the level of scrutiny that goes into it, uh, how everything gets packaged is very different. Um, so with a lot of people that are building uh, what's uh, called a link cartridge for Salesforce Commerce Cloud, uh, typically what that is, is it's more of a reference implementation. So you're giving somebody all of the code and they can see every little bit of the code, every line of the code. And if, whenever they go and imp install that uh, cartridge on their site or deploy it on their site, uh, you know, they can go and they can make tweaks and changes uh, as however they need to, to be able to accommodate the business logic on their site or sites. You know, if they need to branch it, do something here or there, they can. Uh, with the app exchange pr uh, process and deploying things to the app exchange, uh, you can't do that, um, at least not with managed packages. Um, and, and that's what we typically look for with these app exchange partners is that they're giving us a managed package. There are operational benefits to it being a managed package versus a managed package versus just flat out code. Um, and so it really requires a much different mindset when you're developing an app exchange package as opposed to a link cartridge, because really you've got to cover all of the scenarios that people that are going to be using that cartridge need to be able to cover and you need to be able to then drive that off of configuration. Um, and so that was something that I think was definitely missing in some of the first releases of these app exchange packages. Um, the other thing that was kind of missing was a lot of documentation to go along with those app exchange packages, because again, you can't see the code. Once an app exchange package is deployed and once it gets installed, we as system implementers, we can't see any of the code that's that's going into that. So we know maybe there's a touch point here or there um, that is going to work with this data object. So like on a uh, for a payment gateway integration, right? It's going to look for these invoice objects, these credit memo objects in different statuses. And then based on that, it's going to go and capture a payment. Uh, refund a payment, something like that. But we don't get to see exactly what it's looking for, what steps it's looking for. Um, and so that's very different from the the Commerce yeah. Cloud Link uh, paradigm. Okay. Yeah, and like I think it's 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 a really important thing, and, and kind of goes back to what Mike was talking about at the beginning of this question, which is the Heroku connector and that being kind of a black box. Well, you add these things together, and you have a black box of the connector from Commerce Cloud, and then you have these packages which are built so that you don't have to do anything with them, which is great. But the downside of that is when you when something does go wrong in that chain, there's a lot of places that you, as, as an implementer, you're looking to debug that and see where the, see what happened. A lot of them, you don't even get access to debug logs to see how it's flowing through. So there's a lot of time spent in just sort of hunting down uh, and tr troubleshooting where these things happen. That's a, a much different development process than uh, than on the Commerce Cloud product where you get everything is the cartridge and you can see all the code and, and react to it a little bit easier. And with the like gaps in a particular app exchange package um, in terms of use cases they might not support, we've had to write integrations to work around that. So an example is payment, um, uh, P payment reauth and an auth void from Adyen, their app exchange package doesn't support that natively. So um, it will, you know, you kind of end up with this uh, parallel lane of app exchange package doing calls to Adyen and also your own integration code that you've written um, kind of sidecar uh, in a way working um, with that uh, third party as well to send API calls through a different channel. So it's uh, it's definitely something we can work around and we don't have to say, hey, well, we have to wait for Adyen to implement this piece uh, as much as we want them to just develop it for us. We can accelerate things and get uh, delivery to the customer faster if we just do it ourselves in some cases. Uh, but certainly if we just had uh, app source code access to their app exchange package and we could just be the ISV for that, we could modify it to add those additional product features. And so okay. I think that's definitely one of the trade-offs whenever you're looking at, uh, whenever you're making these decisions around using an app exchange package versus building a point-to-point -point integration versus using uh, you know, an ESB or an ETL tool. Um, you know, 
how much is going to be covered of your use cases with the app exchange package um you know is it going to be as flexible as you need or uh should you then just build your own integration or should you build an integration through an esp i think that's an important consideration that comes out as we're going through requirements definition and looking at your business processes specifically got it okay so this, the the short answer to that long answer is no no shortage of of challenges it sounds like but some some workarounds that you guys have been able to develop which is great and i think later we'll talk a bit about what's what's coming um with this solution as well that that might pertain to some of these challenges so um looking at some of our audience questions we had attendees submit questions when they registered and uh, we've got one you've, you've touched on a little bit. Uh, it is how well does this solution really integrate with Salesforce Commerce, Commerce Cloud? Um, so more comments on that integration. From anybody? Yeah, sure. Um, for for simplicity's sake, I think I'm going to assume you're generally asking about Commerce Cloud B 2 C. Um, so I'm going to frame my answer on that, but I do want to just call out. Uh, you know, obviously with Salesforce labeling a lot of things, Salesforce Commerce Cloud. You also do have um, the Lightning B2B platform, as well as their B2B2C platform. Um, for all of those pieces, right, uh, everything is sitting inside of uh, inside of Salesforce already when you're placing orders through Lightning B2B or through Lightning B2B2C. Um, so the integration component doesn't really uh, come up as much. Um, it's really all of the same backend OMA stuff that you're doing for Commerce Cloud B2C, you're doing for those platforms too. Okay. Um, so as, as I think Mike touched on, uh, Nathan touched on earlier, uh, you know, with Commerce Cloud B2C, you have this uh, Heroku connector that Salesforce provides. And so whenever we go and we're provisioning an OMS org um, and we're getting everything connected, Salesforce goes and they enable this for us. And we do a little bit of setup here and there just to get the basic order data flowing. Um, and so that piece is, is really nice. Um, there are some some challenges that I think that, uh, that we can touch on there. Uh, but in general, we're not having to go and write an integration that's going to pull orders out of Commerce Cloud and push them in. That's that's kind of provided for us. Um, now, I think there are a couple other parts of uh, that integration. Uh, so getting orders out is, is one part of it. Um, we were uh, asked by Salesforce, and it was, a, it was a great opportunity for us to really dive in and, and uh, get more in depth with their product team. Um, as well as with the Commerce Cloud team, but so we were asked to actually write a plugin cartridge for uh, SFRA uh, or the reference application for Commerce Cloud uh, for order management uh, for the order management integration. Um, so we wrote that to enable things like order history, to enable user self service for cancellations and returns. Um, and so that's published out in GitHub, um, and it's something that can be pulled into um, an SFRA project to be able to handle that integration. Um, and then I think the last one uh, is uh, order on behalf of capabilities um, and then synchronization of customer profile information and being able to do some uh, some additional data synchronization beyond just what the order management connector does. Um, and so historically, we had relied upon this service cloud connector from order management um, just in the last three, four months. Uh, the architectural success group at Salesforce has released a new connector um, called the B2C CRM sync um, tool. Um, again, it's a combination of app uh, of uh, Salesforce package and um, Salesforce Commerce Cloud link cartridge, um, but it's really designed to be the path forward uh, on how you connect uh, the sale, the Commerce Cloud B two C system and the uh, the service and sales uh, cloud as well as OMS solutions. Okay, great. All right, so looking at other audience questions, we've got uh, one with several parts. First part one is what e-commerce platforms does Salesforce order management support? I can take that. Uh, you know, really any e-commerce platform that has extensibility and portability of their data, the order data. Um, so a platform that can send ideally REST or SOAP API calls would be ideal. Uh, or if you have middleware that you can use to extract flat files out of that, uh, maybe an older legacy system or something and transform them into, um, you know, data that can be bulk loaded into Salesforce. Uh, really, it, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't matter um, what commerce platform it is. Um, you, you know, you'd want to look at nuances like how, um, and this is getting into more of the e-commerce architect world of, of Steve, uh, for example, but how things are merchandised, how product data looks, you have to make sure there's some fit with Salesforce, but their data model 
is generic uh, enough where they're not um, just going to support SFCC um, stuff. You can map into it um, pretty much from anything. And, um, you know, where we've seen experience for this uh, is, is like, from marketplaces that don't have app exchange packages we've we, uh, used um, channel advisor is a third party kind of um, marketplace aggregation tool uh, for connecting to marketplaces like ebay and amazon and such uh, and getting those orders into the system we basically reverse engineered what salesforce is doing themselves with the payloads that they gave us from um, some of our training workshops as well as payloads that we see going in and out uh, through that Heroku connection. So we reverse engineered that and then we uh, basically replicate those calls with, you know, a different source uh, for what where the data is coming from, in this case, Channel Advisor or, um, you know, any other uh, um, e-commerce system, excuse me, could, could be used there. So, um, you know, lots of flexibility. Okay. Yeah, and then just to reiterate, obviously, natively without having to write a custom integration, you you can integrate Salesforce Commerce Cloud B2C, so the the formerly known as Demandware product, um, Lightning B2B on the on the B2B side of things, as well as the newer uh, B2B to C platform. The only thing that's that is technically Salesforce that's not natively integrated, uh, but can still be integrated via the methods that Mike was talking about would be, uh, would be B2B classic or the old cloud craze product. So that would still need some, uh, some custom integration written to get those objects, uh, translated into the, uh, the OMS objects. Okay. So second part to this question related uh, is what would the integration on Salesforce order management look like with e-commerce platforms other than SFCC and what would be the best way to do so? I think I kind of touched on that with the first uh, answer there. I mean, really, um, you need some way to get product information into Salesforce, ideally. Uh, it can create kind of just-in-time product information for uh, maybe a really basic integration, but generally you're going to need more product level um, and pricing information in the order management system to make it functional for your downstream reporting or your connection to your ERP, those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. So from some source, whether that's your e-comm system or your ERP or wherever that, that uh, information is housed, you're going to want to get that into the order management system. So that's a big piece. Um, we also have, you know, omni-channel inventory is a component of uh, order management, uh, which I don't think we've mentioned in this discussion at all, but is a huge piece because it offers a headless, um, you know, decentralized way to store um, inventory um, information. And, um, you know, we could get way into that, but basically you need to load information into there if you're using that feature. If you, um, if you want to have your inventory levels and um everything not just stored in your e-commerce e system um, so loading that in is just using the standard apis of salesforce uh, like i mentioned before rest and soap are their their big uh supported apis uh, but you can use their uh, bulk loaders to load in csvs um, ideally you have some middleware tooling like mulesoft or something that would aid in transforming all this data and getting it into the platform and causing you a lot less headache but um, getting that data in is the first step. And then uh, inserting orders, uh, ideally in real time, is is the best way to do it. And there are seven or eight, something like that, objects that need to be populated and hydrated in the system to kind of create a new order and have it ready to be um, managed within the OMS, so to speak. So turning that order data into an actionable um, order summary, downstream to fulfillment orders, and everything. Um, so. Again, we've built integrations with these marketplaces, and that's really the kind of external place where I've seen it, uh, you know, where we need to pull in order data. But um, the, the practice should be pretty similar for, uh, let's say, a Magento or, um, you know, WooCommerce or something like that. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I would say specifically, too, there, there is, like, even as you go through the the initial enablement on the platform, they kind of give you some examples of of how to load an order and 
the composite API um, that is allows you. It's a it's a, one of the REST APIs that Salesforce um, maintains and, and publishes. It's really useful for this type of thing where you have to where one order is actually made up of you know nine or ten objects and you actually have to do some inserts and then come back and update records and there's a lot going on to get an order just right uh, to be submitted this way but it's super useful because you can create basically just one request uh, with all of that information in it you know properly defined and it'll submit that order activate that order uh, along with all of the you know, if you do have to create products as it's inbound, you can do that there, uh, creating all the payment information and everything that's required. So it's a really useful way as opposed to uh, having to make an individual call for every object, uh, all the, you know, 10 or whatever, 15 different objects that are involved in setting that up correctly. So there's a lot of options yep. when you do have to go the full custom route. Okay. It doesn't count against your API limits for the, all those yeah. individual requests then as well. Okay, great. And the last aspect of this question, um, any integrations with warehouse management systems? Can I speak to that? Yeah, so there aren't any app exchange packages that are pre-built um, for any integrations with warehouse management systems. Uh, and certified, gone through security review and everything. Um, so this is where for, for the projects that we've worked on, um, with a small exception, um, we've typically looked at using um, some kind of enterprise service bus um, or ETL tool uh, to really help with that. So there are objects inside of Salesforce order management uh, that really represent that order that should be sent down to the WMS um, and that is capable of receiving the status and everything back. Um, and you could... Uh, do a point-to-point -point integration uh, to send that information down to your WMS uh, software, uh, but it can be inefficient. Uh, you know, some of the error handling and everything there could be pr uh, problematic. So, you know, where possible, uh, you know, we would strongly recommend looking at some kind of an ESB ETL tool. So Mike had mentioned MuleSoft, uh, you know, Boomi, Jitterbit, uh, Sterling Integrator are a couple other ones. I, I think there's a number of tools out there. Um, we've had very good luck, I think, with MuleSoft um, just because of some of the connections they've built and now obviously the, the very close relationship that they have with Salesforce. Um, so we find that that helpful. Uh, for those that, for customers that don't really have a uh, a very large WMS, um, so, so maybe some smaller e-commerce players, um, there are some options where uh, you can actually do some of the fulfillment uh, from within your Salesforce org and, and within order management directly. Um, there are a couple of app exchange packages um, that support that. Uh, I think one of those is Zencraft um, that, that's worth taking a look at if, if that fits your needs um, and you don't have an external WMS. Um, it can support pick and pack operations and everything right from Salesforce. Um, it has some integrations with carriers, things like that. So, um, you know, really depending on how how much volume you're doing, if you have that external WMS, uh, you know, it could be a, a very different conversation. So, okay, great. All right, moving on to the next question. We've got an audience member asking, are there app exchange packages for various post-purchase functions like payment refunds and fulfillment services? Yeah, so I'll start. Um, there are a, a number of app exchange packages. We've talked about a few of them already. Mm -hmm. um, but the the nice thing with all these packages is, is there's kind of, when Salesforce was uh, pulling in partners to build these OMS packages, they kind of gave them like, here are the baseline things you need to be able to support right away. So obviously being able to support payment capture, um, but as well as, as refunds was, is part of all of these baseline packages. And so there's Adyen, Braintree, Cybersource, uh, a couple others, maybe Digital River, um, but, and, and a lot more coming basically. If you're a, if you're a partner of Salesforce and you have a, a, a cartridge for B2C Commerce Cloud, you're, you're probably being pressured at this point to get one up for OMS as well. So you're going to see no shortage of, of partners. Every every major payment processor will, will have theirs up on OMS um, uh, pretty soon, I would bet. So, uh, But again, they um, are able to support capturing payments that are authorized on another platform. Um, 
authorization themselves as well as refunds. Um, and then we've done some other uh, custom stuff as well. I think, Mike, you can share more about that. Yeah, and um, with the payment app exchange packages you mentioned, Nathan, and I just wanted to call out that Adyen's specifically going to support um, the asynchronous payments. So they'll have, you know, pending capture amounts. And then once that gets uh, actually passed through and goes through uh, whatever processes on Adyen's side, um, it'll get asynchronously updated through messages back to Salesforce. Um, so we've seen they, they didn't have support for that at the beginning of 2020, but then I think it was like March or April or something, they released uh, kind of support for that. And that's when the Adyen stuff became true. So that, that one we've had good success with, with one of our clients. Um, but for another, yeah, another implementation that I worked on, um, we did a custom integration to authorize.net. Um, and I honestly thought that since we didn't have an app exchange package for it and uh, being a payment integration and doing those in the past, I thought it would be uh, a, a headache, but it was actually one of the more seamless parts of the project. It's it's a lot easier, it turns out, to do a payment integration. Um, it's it's more discreet, it seems like, and less error prone than something like uh, implementing a WMS integration or um, maybe an, a, a, an ERP integration. There's just a lot more meat on the bone there. Um, so that, that turned out to be pretty straightforward. And um, I mean, hopefully we see more and more of these app exchange packages launch, but um, it isn't the biggest concern if we do have to do a custom one, as long as the, the uh, you know, the, the payment platform has a decent um, structured API. Um, and then some of the pieces you, you won't see, I, I alluded to it earlier, auth voids and uh, re auths, you know, running, making sure that those those authorizations stay open. Uh, if you're going to have a long time before something ships um, on that on that person's that customer's card, uh, we've we've implemented some custom uh, API calls to uh, to be, handle that behavior, um, and that's worked fine. It's just kind of annoying because it's just not all in the the, the package. But um, yeah, that's that's worked out pretty well. Um, okay, great. We've also done fulfillment um, integrations with uh, services like Narvar. They have a cartridge um, that handles kind of the basic, uh, you know, RMA creation, um, the the handling of the status uh, generation, their status synchronization between the orders in their system and ours. Um, uh, or sorry, they don't they don't support RMA generation. We actually had to write that custom. Um, so that's kind of uh, another use case that we're waiting for for them to support out of the box that we had to work around. Um, but uh, they do have yeah, and, um, at least some of the bases covered. Okay. Yeah, and then I think um, a couple other ones. Uh, so I think tax integrations uh, are in particular uh, pretty important uh, and, and pretty nice to have. Uh, so. Um, Avalara has an app exchange package, Vertex has an app exchange package, or is, is working on one. I can't remember if it's actually certified or not at this point. Um, but so being able to write those tax ledgers, being able to adjust those tax ledgers for returns um, or for appeasements um, is also very nice. So being able to have your uh, system of record uh, and, and where you're doing your remittance from tied into the order management system, um, you can now drive that through Salesforce OMS instead of that needing to be driven through your order, through your ERP or through your financial system. Um, so, I mean, obviously some reconciliation can still happen back there, but uh, it, it's definitely nice to have. Okay, great. Um, okay, another another audience question. Can you uh, speak to the process of migrating from a mainframe to Salesforce OMS? <laughs> That's a big no, one. No small question. Yeah, no, no, no small question there. <laughs> Just in a couple seconds. Um, yeah, uh, it, it really is a big one. Um, you know, I, I think it would... There's a process that we like to try and follow. Um, so I, I think maybe I'll touch on a couple of those items. Um, I'll maybe look after after I do, Nathan, for you to, to chime in with anything or Mike. Uh, but I mean, really, where we start from when we're looking at migrating from a legacy system um, to Salesforce OMS is really just doing an analysis of the existing touch points um, and data that customers have. 
Um, so understanding what all information is, do you have in your order objects, in your products, in your customer data, um, so that we can understand what needs to be carried over into the new system, what has value um, to your to your different stakeholders. Um, and I mean, really that then means including stakeholders from operations and logistics, from your contact center, from your e-commerce team. Um, if you have brick and mortar uh, from your retail operations, um, from your wholesaler B2B team, uh, from your finance team, um, information security team. Uh, I think that's been a big one um, is making sure that we're looping in um, IT and IS groups uh, so that they can provide their input on of all the users that are going to be able to access or see this data, who should have access to what, who should be able to change what. Um, and those can become some very critical conversations. Um, so kind of once you've done some of that analysis, then I think uh, making sure that you've got both an outline of where you're starting from system architecture wise, and then where you need to be or where you're going to be at the end of this project, and that if it's going to be a multi-phase project, um, kind of being able to show the traceability for each one of those interfaces as they move uh, to really be able to understand what this is going to look like in flight for, for the duration of the project. Okay. Mike or Nathan, Nathan, anything to add there? I think Nathan's speaking, but I can't hear him. Oh. Nathan, are you there? We may have lost Nathan's oh. audio for the moment. Yeah, it looks like his headset maybe, maybe died. Okay. That's okay. I can I'll touch on. <laughs> yeah. You want to you want to play the part of Nathan for a moment? Yeah, Mike? Like, I'll be Nathan. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean the the data migration we've seen is a huge piece uh, and obviously would be for a, a mainframe or any system to system migration um we you know put a lot of work into a detailed migration plan and worked with our customers to um you know transform that data um but a big decision point is what's going to be managed versus unmanaged orders in um, oms and that's that's a term that they use in the order management system pretty frequently, which for returns as well is managed versus unmanaged. Um, okay. Managed meaning like you're going to have a customer wanting to return something within that. So what's the return window that you have open on these orders? Um, or uh, would they be able to, um, you know, make some kind of adjustment to that order, request a refund or whatever? If, if you want that to happen, it has to be a managed order um, and loaded in a particular way. Uh, if you are just loading it for historical purposes, maybe to sh uh, show on their order history page in Commerce Cloud, that's going to mm -hmm. be an unmanaged order potentially. Um, and there's different uh, considerations to make for your data retention policies and how long that stuff needs to exist. Um, but ultimately, that's a huge factor that goes into it. Um, and, and again, there's a myriad of objects in this object model that need to be loaded, and you have to make a decision whether that in, that information is important enough to um, the operation of that data as well as the historical reporting of that data and everything. Um, Nathan, are you back? I want to make sure you ha have a chance to add. No, I still can't hear you. Mm. Okay. Oh, weird. Okay. Um, well, also, yeah, while, Steve, do you want to add anything else? While Nathan's gonna, yeah, yeah, I think while Nathan's going to try something else there, um, one of the things that I'd add just. Uh, whenever we talk about managed versus unmanaged orders, um, one of the reasons why that's important is just because uh, how Salesforce prices the order management contracts. Um, so the managed orders is what uh, is typically uh, part of that contract. So you're paying uh, per managed order, uh, whereas the unmanaged order, that, that legacy reference data, um, just goes towards general data storage. So mm -hmm. um, it's one of, those, one of those reasons why it's important to really break that stuff out. Nathan, want to try again? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Yes, you're back. There you go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Headset just died. That might have like died, died. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what I was going to say is like I think Mike touched on it really well in terms of evaluating the migration of data and how you're going to bring it in and what all that entails, but. I think at a at a broader level too, when you're talking, especially if you're implementing, if your plan is to implement all these things at the same time, like a, a new commerce cloud implementation, for example, along with OMS 
as well as potentially new API gateways and things like that uh, to connect to your backend systems. Um, well, I mean, all I can say is that the, the longer and the more you take the time to plan ahead of time with a real understanding, and this is something that we really try to do closely with, with our customers, but to, to really get a good understanding of the three platforms or, or more and the roles they're going to play in the ultimate future state and, and make some of those decisions about the data mapping and, and where the source of truth for particular data elements are, really looking in detail at an actual customer and order flow. Um, because every little change, like OMS sort of sits in the middle in that scenario, right? And you're passing things through, it needs to be able to take those in context and and uh, transform an order into a state that your WMS can then use to fulfill the order. And it, it, it really is difficult for order management to be in the middle of that while you know, a million decisions are being uh, made on the fly on the Commerce Cloud side, and the same thing is happening with, you know, potentially with an API gateway on the other side. So defining those things and, like, really sticking with them, obviously there's always going to be changes and there's always going to be um, the things that need to, uh, to be adapted to, but the more you can have a set plan for what that API needs and what it needs inbound and, and where it needs to go and, do that planning ahead of time, and you'll be better off for it in the in the implementation. Okay, great, great points. Um, we are closing in on the hour, so I'd love to circle back to our lengthy uh, conversation about challenges, unexpected challenges, and and what advancements or enhanced functionality, you know, do you both expect to see based on you know what what you know is coming with the solution and also what's your wish list what would you like to see uh being developed with order management going forward sure so i, I think some of the challenges that have been called out earlier uh, there are definitely items on the roadmap um so the heroku being a black box and some of the account creation pieces and being able to match accounts um that's on the roadmap um to be able to to define those rules beyond what today is just based off the email address um, so i think that's going to be a, a huge one um, especially for multi-site multi-country uh, implementations where you may have a customer that spans multiple brands or multiple geographies yeah um i think some of my favorite stuff like mike, mike said this right at the beginning some of the best stuff in the OMS platform is the service cloud modules and, and the way that it plugs into that and, and some of the stuff that is there uh, for customer service to be able to manage and process returns and things like that. However, there are a few things that are still missing that uh, when you say, here's the ability to do refunds, but you can't do exchanges yet. And what that ends up meaning is, is there's, there's all kinds of wonky workarounds that you have to do to make stuff like that work alongside the standard, knowing the whole time that that's probably coming in one of the next couple of releases. Um, so it, it can be a challenging thing, but again, I think that stuff we'll see uh, more and more of. And I think you know the next step of that too is a little bit more functionality uh, around potentially placing orders for a customer service rep. So. Uh, currently, one of the ways this happens, at least with the Commerce Cloud implementation, is uh, with that connector, the other, uh, the B2C CRM sync, the old uh, Service Cloud connector package, to be able to click a button and log into the storefront as the customer. But even that presents some challenges on the, uh, the Commerce Cloud side for getting some different functionality for the rep when they're there doing that. Um, I'd like to see some some stuff coming around the ability to, for a rep to place an order directly from Salesforce and and have that sync to Commerce Cloud. Um, you know, some of the payment processors or processors will probably have to come along for the ride on that type mm -hmm. of functionality. But uh, I do think that would be some really nice value add stuff and and like the ability to create an account from Salesforce that that is automatically pushed over and synced and set up correctly in Commerce Cloud. I think some stuff to like just tighten that up a little bit would be uh, would be really cool and I think is 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 on the roadmap stuff that we had discussed with Salesforce before. Great. 
Yeah, and um, you know, as we've gone in and tried to work around these things, uh, you know, going in and doing technical designs, working with the developers, we've ran into some hiccups, uh, more or less, with how something we might have designed works. So, for example, I've uh, had some situations where we want to just uh, trigger some logic to happen when a fulfillment order is generated and sent to the warehouse. But we found that the Salesforce object model doesn't support triggers on the fulfillment order or the order summary or some of these key objects. You can use platform events to get around it, which we ended up doing, but this makes this solution a lot more cumbersome. And sometimes we could just end up with some uh, kind of duct taped on custom fields that we're using to trigger some logic or something. And uh, we don't like that. So, um, you know, getting those uh, objects that are new to OMS to have the same feature parity for automation and things like field history tracking uh, on order summary is another example. That's the kind of stuff we're just kind of waiting, like Salesforce engineers are probably working on as we speak, but um, cause some additional um, time and complexity. Um, and then like Nathan said, the service cloud stuff, and as I said in the beginning, that's the kind of bread and butter of order management. And, probably where we get the most, um, you know, eyes lighting up from customer service teams and um, ops teams and stuff, because it, it is better than what they're used to. If they're going into business manager to do uh, things that they've customized or going into some kind of, you know, green screen program in, in some of the far worst cases. But, um, you know, they that that enables them and we're waiting for a lot of those features. But Things like um, zero dollar orders or replacement orders, we've been able to write um, custom order interfaces for and uh, kind of get our own um, astound magic to go in and, and make that stuff happen um, while we wait for the roadmap to, to catch up. Um, but it, you know, the, the technical side is, is where I spend a lot of my time, um, you know, making sure that these, these integrations work, these customizations to the platform work. And, um, I've also seen just some of the APIs. Salesforce has done a really good job of writing these APIs that are easy to snap into flows and drop into declarative configurations in the platform. But that also mm -hmm. comes with limits, just like we were saying with App Exchange packages being closed source. We uh, can't modify Salesforce's own platform source code uh, for obvious reasons. So, um, you know, something like an RMA generation, if we call an API action to create an RMA or return order in the system, we can't pass in custom attributes. We have to insert that RMA and then afterwards make another update call to get that object that was just created and then strap on some additional um, fields to it. So it's it's really uh, inefficient to do that. And, you know, we're, t we're talking about another API call um, for something that might be uh, done like a thousand times because we have a thousand uh, returns coming in from a uh, buy online return in store scenario or something. So uh, just just to stuff like that uh, is, is, my, is on my wish list. So if anybody from Salesforce is watching, hopefully they're taking that in consideration. And if not, you can write your next three-part series on exactly what you'd yeah. like to happen with this offering. So we'll do that um, and go to the office hours and pester them a little more. Exactly. Okay. Um, speaking of of your uh, writing on this topic, we will, uh, I think, already have uh, available for download each article in that series on this webinar platform. So um, attendees, you should be able to grab those articles and review what Mike has written Mike in the past. Um, and so that's that's available now. And uh, while those downloads are happening, I will thank our participants. This has been really educational, um, super helpful. I know you guys um, spend, you know, 99% of your time working on this stuff. So taking a break to talk about it is much appreciated. Uh, and we will keep the conversation going. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thanks yeah, very thank much. you very much.